It's great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, likewise. Exciting. Uh, so before we get started, maybe you can just tell people who don't know you, you know, a brief background about who you are and, and why you work in Web3. Cool. Yep. So my name is Sid Gandhi. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Polybase. Um, we're building a decentralized database for Web3. I think uh, what my journey into Web3 was pretty interesting. Started in 2012 with Bitcoin, then in 2013, 2014 with Ethereum. Read the white papers, loved it, told all my friends about it. They said, <laughs> obviously, this is a huge scam. Don't put your money into it. Um, <laughs> fast forward many years uh, and kind of following the ecosystem and decided to launch uh, a company to help improve some of the infrastructure uh, side of things last year. So my understanding is that you have a background as a developer. Is that, is that yeah, right? Yeah, I was a software engineer for many years. Um, I started working at a couple startups uh, as an iOS developer. I actually ended up working at Apple for a couple of years on iOS 9, 10, and 11. Um, one of the, I think, most exciting things I worked on there was the Hey Siri, Get Me an Uber feature. Um, and so I was basically the, the tech lead for that, uh, ended up, you know, having these secret meetings with Uber and Lyft and uh, <laughs> a bunch of other ride sharing companies, uh, in true Apple fashion, uh, and launched that with iOS 10. So was that kind of overlapping with you discovering Bitcoin and Ethereum or, or did you start working in Web3 space right away? No. So I think, you know, my relationship with Web3 was was hobby, was interest, was side project okay. um, all the way up until last year. Um, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. OK, so Polybase is the first company that you've worked in in Web3 and the first company that you've launched for Web3. OK, that's cool. wow. So you must have felt really like this was the thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, my co-founder and I will talk a little bit more about him, but We've always been fascinated by like the underlying technology um, of a distributed ledger. Ever since like reading that Bitcoin white paper, I was like, this is of sure. course going to change the world. This is completely different and new. And, and kind of, I'll we've just gone jump in to say like anybody that hasn't read the white paper, you really should. It seems like something that's really intimidating. Like, oh, if I'm not a technical person, I won't find this interesting. I am not a technical person, as viewers of the show know, and yet I found it interesting. It's really easy to read. It's really short. It's actually a fun read because it's really well written. Yeah. So anyway, just wanted yeah, to put that out there. It, and it's aged really, really, really well. Like you could imagine mm -hmm. that same thing being written today, um, which is really hard to say of anything technical that's 10 years old. Um, and that's so I think that point. just goes to like how foundational it was. And I'm getting goosebumps right now because I do still remember when I read it um, <laughs> and, and kind of like the, the digging I did after that. Uh, and that's the feeling that still inspires me today to continue working in the space. Um, what we're doing now at Polybase is a kind of contrarian in many ways, similar to, you know, the original um, kind of feeling that, that the Bitcoin white paper had. Um, but we're kind of operating in this existing culture of Web3. And so that's that is a constant tension uh, that we have and that we play with is focusing on the technology, but also understanding the culture and, and kind of battling in between those two things. We can dig into that too. Yeah. So jumping into Polybase, can you just kind of give us a little bit of an overview of what it is and, and why you decided it was the thing for you to do? Yeah. So we basically call Polybase the database from the future. It's a fundamentally, it's a decentralized database but it has a lot of attributes that we have come to know from blockchains. Things like uh, verifiability, transparency, um, control, data sovereignty. Um, but what we've done is we've actually built all of those features on top of traditional databases rather than a distributed ledger. So that's kind of the key innovation we're playing with. The way we make that work and the technology that makes that possible is zero-knowledge cryptography. So if you've heard okay. of zero-knowledge proofs, uh, they can be used for privacy, of course, but then actually they can also be used for scalability and speed and performance. The fundamental reason why is in Ethereum, every transaction has to be redone by every single validator node, right? We know right. this. That's why it's very slow, you know, 15 second confirmation. Um, in Polybase, only one node has to do the work 
and then it publishes a very concise proof that it did the work correctly. And when every other node gets this proof, they can actually easily validate that you did the work correctly. Now, there's a lot of kind of cryptographic mathematical magic that goes on in the background, uh, but that's kind of the fundamental reason why only one node has to do the work. And so you get this really big efficiency boost. You get a very mm -hmm. um, big cost reduction and you basically get the same performance and cost as a database, but with all these benefits that we've come to expect from blockchains. Interesting. So there, is there a public ledger of these? Is it auditable in the same way that blockchains are? Yes, exactly. And that the auditing comes from what we call the, uh, the Merkle tree roots. Um, and that's basically a technical way of saying we actually take a snapshot of all the data in Polybase um, and we actually squeeze it into a hash, which is a small compact oh, wow. representation of, of all the data. Um, and that provides the immutability. So at any point, if you have that, you know, small compact representation of all the data in Polybase and someone changes some data uh, that they weren't allowed to change, it's very trivial to prove that they did the wrong thing. Cool. So is Polybase the company and Polybase the protocol? Like what's the relationship there? So Polybase is both the company and uh, the protocol and, and the product. We have a couple different uh, products under the Polybase brand. So we have the Polybase database, which is the storage layer um, that developers interact with to uh, create tables, store data, retrieve data. We have Polybase authentication, which is the auth layer that allows for wallet login, but we also have email password login, um, similar to other uh, kind of like wallet authentication providers. And then we have what we call Polylang. That's a new programming language that we've created. Uh, it's very, very similar to TypeScript or JavaScript, uh, which is basically the most widely used language in the world. So if you know JavaScript, you know Polylang. Now, the really cool thing is we take those Polylang code that developers write and we compile it into zero knowledge circuits. That is what enables us to produce those proofs that can prove that I ran a particular set of code or function or whatever uh, correctly um, and then allow other people to verify that I did that correctly. So I would say right now it's the most user-friendly way to use zero knowledge proofs is Polylang, which is embedded into the Polybase database. Okay, awesome. And so is it is it referencing the data that's stored in some other sort of decentralized network like IPFS or Arweave or something like that? That's a very common question we get. Um, the answer is no. Uh, Polybase nodes actually both store the data uh, and do um, the, the zero oh. knowledge proof roll up and verification. Uh, in our architecture, we are planning on making that more pluggable so that other storage backends can be used. For example, like you mentioned, IPFS, Arweave, um, uh, even traditional like uh, AWS or Amazon cloud services uh, backends um, as well. And so that is something that we've planned in the future. But today we offer basically this vertical, vertically integrated solution that makes it very easy for a developer to come in. They want a database basically one click and they have a database up and running. Okay. So it's kind of like a blockchain, but not quite a blockchain. What's the consensus method then? Yeah, exactly. So I think the one of the key innovations we did is we looked at consensus and we looked at storage. And in a blockchain, those two are kind of inherently combined. Um, and that causes a lot of these inefficiencies that we see in blockchains where, you know, the storage cost on Ethereum to store data is about uh, $10,000 per megabyte of storage. That goes up and down depending on the gas fees. But anyways, it's it's gigantic, Sure, right? sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so what we've done is we split those two things. Mm -hmm. So our consensus mechanism, uh, we've built from the ground up in Rust. It's called Solid. The reason we had to rebuild our own consensus mechanism is that it needs to be what I call zk -able. So we need to be able mm. to create zero knowledge proofs for the consensus layer as well. And then another benefit the splitting gives us is that the storage becomes completely separate, which allows us to, what I mentioned earlier, to have these different storage backends, um, which reduces the cost of storage. So you're not storing directly on chain anymore. Um, mm -hmm. You're storing 
going off chain, but then you have these cryptographic proofs that that storage is correct. And, uh, you know, that storage respects the rules that you've written in Polylang. So it all kind of like, you see how it's like all fitting together in this way um, to make a system that kind of looks like a blockchain, uh, but is as fast as a database. Gotcha. Okay. And so is there some sort of token that's associated with it or how is how does the incentive mechanism work? Good question. Um, we have different phases in our roadmap. Right now, we are in our private mainnet phase, which is a unincentivized mainnet. So Polybase is running all the nodes right now. We are still publishing proofs, which means if we do something wrong, it's actually uh, trivial to validate um, using the cryptographic proof. Uh, but we are okay. running all the nodes. Uh, March 2024, we have set a date for our full mainnet, which means token launch, fully incentivized uh, mainnet like you would expect in an L1. Well, that's exciting. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to some regulatory issues. Has that been a factor for you guys in figuring out how you would go about your token launch at all? Or are you feeling comfortable with that with that path right now? I don't think anyone is feeling comfortable with the regulatory <laughs> In, in crypto. Um, yeah. I think the reason we we pushed out our token launch plans to next year um, is because we want more clarity and I think we want the dust to settle a little bit. The really cool thing is because we're using zero knowledge proofs as our security mechanism rather than um, you know a, a robust validator set like Ethereum uses, uh, we can actually provide a lot of the value to our customers and developers without the token launch. Um, what the token launch will allow is basically a censorship resistance so that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if our nodes shut down, your data is still available. Um, but in fact, right. a lot of our customers don't actually need that censorship resistance. You know, they're not building applications and protocols that governments are trying to shut down. Um, and so if you're doing that, Ethereum is still probably the best place to try to do that, although we've seen even things like Tornado Cash uh, can be taken down in many ways, um, even if you're built on Ethereum. And so that's kind of our thesis is that we can actually push out the token launch uh, a little bit to get more uh, regulatory clarity, but still be able to deliver value to our customers. That's really cool. That's really interesting, actually, because it's, it is it is like something that I've thought about is just how tragic it is, frankly, that the lack of regulatory clarity is, you know, the way that that's holding back the industry. I've said this before, but there's just, it's sort of selecting for not the best among us when it comes to mm -hmm. who is kind of getting products out there successfully, because, you know, you either have those of us who have been in it for 10 years now, who are just like, care about the the change that this technology can bring to all of our daily lives in such a profound way that we're willing to sort of, you know, swim in the murky waters, or you have the, the opportunists, I guess would be the nicest way to describe them, who are looking to make a quick buck and, you know, prey on people's, um, I don't know, you know, naivete about this. And it's, it's, it's really tragic, especially now 10 years in that, that it's still going on because mm. that means that, well, I guess it's more than 10 years for some people, but most of us 10 years, um, mm -hmm. that it's, that it's still going on because now people are getting sort of repeatedly burned. And so now it's like, well, you mm. purport to be this more trustworthy system. And yet all of these terrible things have happened. I have even less trust now than I did maybe even before. So it's, it's just yeah. a terrible spot for all of us. So I think that's really interesting that you're able to experiment because it sounds like you're really kind of experimenting in a lot of ways. Like you're really, you're not just kind of focusing on one piece or one small portion, but you're actually building quite a, a lot of the different pieces of the stack for the developers and, 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 and rethinking about how they should go together in new and different ways. And you're able to experiment with that without having that token kind of pressure for you guys, because when the price goes up and down, that creates all kinds of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, noise that's just not helpful. And, you know, then of course the regulatory issues as well. So that's really cool. What kind of apps or dApps are using Polybase right now? Yeah, it's 
really been across the board. We have um, around 1,200 monthly active collections on Polybase right now. Um, applications ranging anywhere from decentralized social, which is actually a really good fit for what we're doing um, because you can't run a whole decentralized social network on chain. Uh, and the folks that are doing it right now um, are being heavily subsidized by the ecosystem, um, which obviously doesn't last forever. Uh, so that's going to be a little cautionary tale. Um, other applications include uh, DeFi as well. So some folks are starting to build um, high performance decentralized exchanges. And so you want it to be off chain to get the performance, but you want it to be secure, obviously, because you're um, running large amounts of TVL through there. Um, we've also seen applications that are doing self-sovereign data. So um, there's one particular customer that I'm excited about, offramp.xyz. Um, shout out to them. They're building a decentralized off-ramp system, um, but they basically connect to your bank to validate that transactions are being deposited in your bank so they can release funds on chain. Now, to do that, they have to store your bank details. Users don't want that stored in other people's servers, um, especially mm -hmm. if they're trying to be a centralized system. Um, and so the way OfferAmp stores data in Polybase is actually encrypted with the user's wallet, the user's private key. Um, we were talking about this as I was preparing for the interview. I would love to hear more. It's, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Yeah. So that's, you know, when we say self-sovereign self data, it sounds cool, but like, right, what does that actually mean? How do you implement that? Right. Um, so it's just a buzzword. You, in, you encrypt it in a way that only someone that has a private key of that wallet can decrypt that data. Now, that person can then uh, share the ability to decrypt that data with another wallet. So that's how you kind of do sharing, but no one else can read it. And obviously, you're not going to be sharing your private key which means you can't just go and share that data with, with someone that you're not authorized to. So that's how we're kind of building up this idea of self-sovereign data, of user-owned data, that even though the data is not stored on your computer, it's stored on the Polybase decentralized network, um, you still have control over it. And if someone hacks Polybase, which is not going to happen, um, but if that happens, they only get that encrypted data and they can't do anything with it. So that's kind of a, the, the security layer that we're building around it. Um, other applications, we started to actually see Web2 enterprise customers um, seriously look at Polybase to replace some of the things they were doing with enterprise private blockchains. So you, you probably know if you've been around in the space for a while, like enterprise uh, private blockchains got really big in like 2014, 2015, uh, with Hyperledger and a couple other companies, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably fair to say adoption was pretty minimal at the end of the day um, because right. of key issues around uh, privacy, scalability, and ease of use. Um, so companies actually don't want fully public blockchains. Um, right. Uh, they they want they need something that's extremely scalable. A lot of these companies have you know millions of monthly active users. Doesn't work uh, on a blockchain even. The fastest L2s don't support that kind of uh, speed. And then ease of use, it's a whole new paradigm. So all their existing developers at a large enterprise have, are like, okay, now we have to relearn some new programming language. We have to relearn a new paradigm. Yeah. I think that's With one Polybase, of the things that's actually weakest in Web3 is that because Web2 has had so much time to iterate and really dial in the either the user mm -hmm. experience or the developer experience, there's so much tooling everything has just been so polished that we're just used yeah. to things being quick and slick. And 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 then you go look at some of these Web3 things and you're like, wow, is it 1990? Like what's going on? You know, it's just right. so clunky and tough. So I, I, yeah, what are you guys doing to overcome that? You know, I, I talked about the three pain points that enterprises are having with blockchains, right? Uh, scalability, uh, privacy, and ease of use. And we're solving all three of those. And so from a scalability side, I kind of talked about how we're just as fast as a regular database. So that kind of checks the boxes uh, there. Uh, cost as well. So we don't, you know, it's you don't have like a per transaction gas fee that you have mm -hmm. to pay. Um, the second thing is the uh, privacy. So, you know, in a blockchain, you're like fully public. 
in a traditional database, you're fully private um, mm -hmm. and you're running that yourself in your own data center. Now, what Polybase allows you to do is actually turn a knob that can go between this, this spectrum of public and private. And the way you do turn that knob is by writing your permission permissions system and permissions code in Polylang in whatever way you want. So you can say these columns of data in this database should actually be public. These other columns oh, cool. should be readable only by someone that owns this wallet. And these other columns should actually be completely private, only readable by the company. That's on the read side. You can also write those kind of rules on the, on the writing data and updating data side. And so you have this really granular control between public and private, which actually, if you think about it, most applications need something yeah. between public and private. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be fully public. They don't, they don't need to be fully private. And so that's something kind of a new power that we're giving to, to enterprises here. And then on the ease of use side, we the programming model and the architecture is very similar to a database. So someone coming from a traditional um, you know, enterprise that's worked on databases like Oracle or Postgres or MongoDB uh, immediately understands how to use Polybase and, and kind of the, the paradigms and, and the architecture that we're building. So there's no real learning curve Smart. there. That's awesome. How about the, the composability? So um, like from the writing side, so let's say that I, I publish something with a, do I decide the schema when I publish it? Uh, the developer creating the database decides the schema. Um, okay. Even for that component, uh, they can give permissioning to other people to edit the schema. Traditionally, you don't want to do that. Um, the schema should stay stable and it should actually be public. Um, the actual data in there can, can be highly permissioned. Uh, but yes, you create that schema and then you can give permissions to people to read and write into that schema. And so then let's say somebody else comes along and wants to create an app that or a DAP that's like very similar to mine. We're using the same type of data. We're both making, you know, a music app or something like that. Mm -hmm. Would they automatically use the same schema? Would our would there be composability that way between us? Like could they use my data set and I could use their data set depending, I guess, on how we set the parameters of whether it's public or private? Yes, uh, they can. So for example, um, yeah, we can, we can use kind of like a music social graph or something like that as an example. Um, if it's permissioned in a, in a user uh, sovereign way, it means that the actual underlying data is is mine as a user. The developer has just created the schema and the front end application for me to add data. Now I can actually go to another developer that's created another application um, that chooses to use that same schema. And if I log in with my wallet in that second application, uh, all of that data from the first application will show up there because it's based on my wallet. So that's kind of how you can have this composability. Uh, the same way, for example, that Uniswap uh, has a front end that you can use, but you can actually use different front ends uh, that someone creates for Uniswap and you can do the same exact functionality because the underlying smart contract is public and shared. A smart contract in a blockchain is very similar to the schema and the permi permissioning rules in Polybase. You can kind of think of okay. those as the same. Yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. Okay, so kind of zooming out a little bit, let's just talk about Web3 in general. What is your vision for Web3? And importantly, how do you think we will get from where we are now to that vision? It's kind of funny. I think I would say like in a parallel to how we, I talked about how we're splitting kind of this consensus and storage, splitting the technology of Web3 and splitting the culture of Web3 is going to be really important to move forward. The reason I say that is regulatory concerns, enterprise adoption, um, they really care about uh, the technology part of Web3. Now, the culture and the community has actually been the thing that has increased the adoption of that technology right now in a very small niche of people, um, but eventually into a larger future um, you know, hopefully everyone's a Web3 user in five years, right? So I think looking at those things differently is very, very important and understanding like 
where we want the technology to go. Um, more decentralization, new technologies like ZK proofs, um, and how those affect uh, the actual parameters of a system and, and how regulatory, how regulation looks at those things versus, you know, where we want to take this culturally. Uh, NFTs backing physical goods, NFTs as memberships, um, NFTs as community gating tools, uh, and, and being able to push those things separately is, I think, very, very important. Right now, I think they're, they're very conflated. Um, and that's why you have issues where people are doing these like token launches off of these supposedly innovative, you know, L2 solutions or, or whatever. Um, and they're trying to conflate this like community with the technology and you end up kind of having a bad situation um, where they're like not delivering and things like that. So that's kind of what I want to see is like projects and companies being very clear, like, are we pushing the technology forward? Are we pushing the, the community and the culture forward? Um, and let's not let's not try to combine the two and uh, give people hope where there really isn't hope, right? Interesting. Okay. When the Web3 vision is realized, what what do you think will be different in our day-to-day lives? I think it's really about choice. Today, like when we use applications, we are actually quite limited in our choices of how we interact with those applications. You can only use Facebook through Facebook. You can only use Instagram through Instagram. Um, right. If they change something, you just have to accept it and, and move on. Mm-hmm. Versus one example I always like to bring up is email. Email is one of the original like decentralized open protocols. You can use whatever email client you want, right? And you can still e- email me even if I'm on Hotmail and you're on you know, Yahoo. <laughs> in 1998, or if today I'm on, you know, superhuman and you're on, you know, Apple mail or whatever, everything works. That is something that we've lost. Theoretically. Theoretically, Yeah. There's some features that might be. The, the problem is there's a great tweet that I've, I've used as an example before, but email has essentially become another oligopoly controlled by, you know, you can call it big tech if you want to at this point in so far as If I were to attempt to run my own email server here out of our office, my emails would not reach you. They would be caught by your spam filters as potentially spam because they're not going through the big, I don't know the number that are like sanctioned, but you know, like if it were car companies, the big three, like it would just be like, there are kind of an official set that are, are considered, you know, uh, trustworthy to filter your spam. And if you are not one of those, you don't end up in people's inboxes. And I only bring this up because I see it as like going to make me cry. It's so tragic that it's like our, it's like, it's like the last holdout, right. Of Mm -hmm. like pure protocol based. I mean, sure. We still have like, I don't know, some file, um, like FTP or something like you can still transfer files if you like really want to, you know, commit to something like that. But that, that your every average, everyday average internet user believes that internet, I mean, that email is this protocol that we still can reach each other is a myth. And it's really sad that it's gotten to this point because it was kind of the last thing that we had from the early days of the open internet. Now we're in this walled garden system and even email has been captured at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right that the, the point of web three is to, you know, re-decentralize the web to get back to that place where we do have these trusted protocols that are connecting us in a way that we have control over that connection. Um, And that it's going to come down to whether or not the incentive mechanisms are able to be implemented properly, right? Because we got the email oligopoly because we went the route of allowing big tech to be that filter for us rather than something like Adam Back's hash cash, which would have, you know, given us independently a way to prevent spam reaching us. Right. And right. so that's going to just be this like major, and it's just like a major question mark right now because you guys are experimenting with Web3, but you don't have the incentive piece implemented and you've kicked it down the field, rightly so, because of the regulatory ambiguity. 
And, you know, we're seeing all of these different attempts at incentivization, some working really well, some not so much. And, you know, where that lands, I think, is is the biggest open question at this point in some regard. Do you have a sense yeah. of what you think will work, won't work? You know, what what are your thoughts when it comes to the incentivization aspect? Yeah, I, I love this. I love this. I think you drilled down to the very part of it, which is we lost, like, in a way, we ruined it for ourselves. And by that, I mean, like, <laughs> email companies, uh, companies, bots, whatever, started spending, sending lots of spam. And so we did have to basically resort to someone's help um, to address that. Um, and yes, I think incentivization, specifically staking and slashing, are the key um, drivers that I think can solve a lot of the spam problems, which um, which end up reducing like choice and decentralization. So I would say like, yeah, like why, you know, the, the kind of email service I would like to see is if I want to send an email, I have to stake. And if... 50% or greater of people mark it as spam, I lose my stake. That's one, you know, I'm creating some parameters here, but those parameters mm -hmm. can be changed. But the staking and slashing uh, works in many different places. For example, online reviews. Everyone talks about how like 90% oh. of Amazon reviews stake. But what if you just had people stake for reviews and, you know, that little thumbs up, thumbs down you get on a review, is it helpful, is it not helpful, actually determined whether you earned uh, fees for providing a good review or you got slashed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I don't see enough of these small incentives applied into all right. these places where spam is a big problem. Um, that, that is kind of one of the things that we're trying to encourage in Polybase is because we're kind of building this like scalable version of a blockchain. Today, if you tried to do what I just mentioned with email and, and reviews on blockchain, it wouldn't be possible. There's just the volume and transaction size and speed wouldn't wouldn't be there. But you can build something like that on Polybase today. And so that I, I'm very much aligned with what you said. And it that the fairness of it actually comes mm -hmm. down to like a core value for me as well. Um, and staking and slashing can actually be used to create really fair mechanisms. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, fully aligned with you on that. Let's let's build that. Let's see it. That's super interesting. I I'll have to think more about that because so what immediately comes up for me is just like the game theory mechanics of how we get to that point, right? Because um do do people are too accustomed to everything being free online. It's it, it's one of those things I personally feel super conflicted about because it's yeah. wonderful that there's so much access and it's tragic that there there's almost hate if it's something other than free, right? It's like, yeah. and yet creators need to be paid. People who are providing all of this value online, it, it is a real way that people really make money today. And mm. so where does that money come from? And and, and so the key question is, why would somebody stake in order to, let's say, write Yelp reviews? Because right, right. now they're able to write those Yelp reviews for free. And the right. only person that they're hurting, a very good friend of our family owns a restaurant. And so I personally understand the the extreme harm you can do with, a Yelp, with an unjustified Yelp review, essentially, right? right? And... And and there's no recourse. She has no recourse. The, right. our, our restaurant owner friend. She has no recourse. But why would this person who's writing the nasty review? Why would they think? Oh, I'm I'm comfortable, you know, putting up five staking. Let's even say five dollars in order to be able to do this. Like how? What's the game theory that? Yeah helps to onboard people into this idea. Do you have any sense of that? It's the thing that I think yeah. we're struggling with as an industry, frankly, is like, or you brought up, you know, decentralized social. That's another one of those game theory questions. It's just like, yeah, but all of my friends are over there. Why would I go to this new thing where I have to like pay money and the user interface like doesn't work very well on right. my phone and, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, so staking and slashing has a like hidden I think component of uh, earning fees, right? So when you stake, 
you have to have the ability to earn fees and have some incentive to stake. So, and this is a very high level answer. I don't have like the fully fleshed out product here, right? But totally fine. you would say, okay, right now I write a Yelp review. I don't really get anything out of it. I get no monetary benefit out of writing a Yelp review. But you see these people that are like Yelp elite or like, you know, whatever. <laughs> and right. And, and, um, they just, they like being helpful, I guess. And, you know, if, if let's say I stake five, five dollars on writing this review, if people find it helpful and if it's a genuinely helpful and realistic review, uh, maybe I get paid out X cents per week or per month or something mm-hmm. for helping other people. That seems like a fair trade. Um, it does. If someone writes a disparaging, unfair, untrue uh, review on your friend's restaurant, people probably won't thumbs up that review mm-hmm. and will probably not. Especially if she's helpful. able to respond to it and say, here's the 17 things that we did to try right. to make you happy, right? Right, yeah. right. And, and again, they, there can be complications. Like, is that a back and forth thread? Like how many responses, whatever. But the sure. idea is, you know, did the majority of people feel this was a accurate, fair review? If it was, then you'll get paid commission on it. If it wasn't, then you may get slashed. Um, mm-hmm. But then that's the risk. I think that's a great point. And I think that there's proof that that incentive mechanism already works in some ways, because I see influencers share those types of links where if the somebody in their network that they've shared it with uses it, they get paid, but then also the right. the person that used it gets an, a portion of it, you know? And so there is kind of these incentive mechanisms on web too that kind of prove that that idea could work where there's um, a mutuality to the exchange, right? I'm putting up this value and in exchange for that value, I will be rewarded. Um, yeah. I think you're right. I think that that could work. I still think it's a question of how we get from where we are to there because there's going, yeah. you know, it, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of experimentation along the way. I think it's a cultural shift. Uh, I'll make a parallel here. So what you're basically saying is if I can write a review for free, why would I pay to write a review? It's kind of like a flip of what I would expect. So what I'm saying is maybe you get some commission, right? And maybe that mm-hmm. is a good monetary model, but that's going to require a cultural mindset mindset shift but that shift isn't as big as you think because in the past you were always staking to when you said something or when you reviewed something the stake wasn't monetary the stake was your reputation right as a person or as a community or as a family or whatever your affiliation was that has gone away on the internet there is no reputation on the internet right like the classic you might be chatting with a dog on the internet and so (laughs) Anonymity has reduced the cultural incentives around reputation staking. Mm. But when we recommend things to our friends that we know, we do stake our reputation. Like, I'm not going to recommend a bad restaurant to a friend. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to give a fake review to a friend because that's that's going to, you know, my reputation will get slashed, essentially. Right, right. The cultural cultural mindset shift is that we have to replace that reputational stake with monetary stake in an anonymous environment like the internet. And if we can culturally make that mindset shift, that's the kind of internet that I want to live in. Because that seems like we're moving towards a fair internet that mirrors the incentives of the physical world, uh, but in a way that's more efficient and more collaborative and, and you know, bridges geographic distances easily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that answer. It's really good. Yeah. Thanks. That replacing <laughs> reputation. It. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I like it. I like it a lot because the, 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 the piece of it that I've thought a lot about is essentially like the attention piece and the, I hadn't thought about it in terms of reputation, but I thought about it more in terms of trust you know, there's, I hear a lot from people, well, how can you know what you can trust online anymore? You can't even like trust your own eyes now. Right. And, uh, and so I have thought about that in terms of, well, people understand that idea of skin in the game. And so if they can, you know, if they're, if they're struggling with, um, investing their attention into, and, and time into a platform where they don't have a sense of trust of 
with whether or not the material they're encountering is true or not, or have mm -hmm. um, some sort of method by which to evaluate that material, then they, I could see there being um, the motivation to put, to recognize, oh, if I put some skin in the game and, and everybody else is having to put skin in the game as well, that will change the way that that you know, trust equation happens and that, yeah. that that would be the motivation for people putting putting some money into it. Um, but reputation yeah. is another way, a really interesting way to think about that same issue. I like that. Yeah. I think people want to trade off the reputation for anonymity. And that's fair. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. cool. Um, but I think it's important to note that anonymity is like a really important part of the internet. Yeah. There's the, this, this sort of movement of people. I've heard Jordan Peterson talk about how, you know, we shouldn't allow people to be anonymous on the internet. And it's just, it's just, he, he hasn't thought about that argument holistically clearly because it's just a really bad argument when you think about, how important, how essential anonymity has been to the history of the internet and just how important it, it is to the culture of the internet too, that there are people that are sharing important information because, because they are anonymous. And right. he's just thinking about the anonymous trolls. And that's just like, it, it's such a small, inconsequential part compared to the larger issue of anonymity on the internet. Yeah, so I, I think mean, it's a great I, point. I they want to trade anonymity for, re, what did you say? Repu this, reputation think, for anonymity? Yeah, yeah, right? So you're, you're yeah. trading that reputation staking system that we've had for 100,000 years for this like fully anonymous system, which has resulted in the spam filled hellhole that the internet is sometimes, <laughs> right? And all I'm saying is like, we actually just need to go back all the way to like why the world worked before in a way. Um, was because people had to stake their reputation. We just have to, you know, we can't basically say, make everyone, you know, you can't use the internet if you're anon anonymous. I think that's a very stupid thing to say. Um, I think you basically need to say, how can we use technology to progress forward, to mm -hmm. recreate those structures, but allow people the benefits of the internet? Anonym anonymity is one of them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, you know, as obviously as a technologist, like you can't, stop the progress you can't stop people from doing what they want you just right. have to create more technological solutions to make those things fair to make sure people don't do the wrong things and hurt other people um things like that so yeah let the internet be the internet right it's cool that you can just go on and do whatever you want that's like really sick um but don't hurt other people if you do or if you you know spam or if you're giving bad yelp reviews and destroying someone's business you sh there should be some consequence. Today, there isn't. Um, Today, there isn't. Yeah. Really the other cool place that I would really love to see consequences is LinkedIn. Like people just claim stuff right. on LinkedIn. Like they'll claim that they've like worked for me. And I'm like, mm, I wish I could say no. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? It's so weird. There's this, guy, there's this guy on Twitter that does these like funny design, like UX designs. And one of them was like community notes for LinkedIn. <laughs> and so like coworkers like, can come in and put notes about a particular thing and be like, actually, he didn't actually work on this project or like she didn't actually help with this project or whatever. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Yeah. It's yeah. so it's so tragic having kind of grown up alongside the internet to have dreamt of what it would be in our lives, only to have it become, you know, <laughs> where it is right now in yeah. terms of the, the the sort of trust and access to information and uh yeah just the cultural conversation has has degraded frankly and it's because of some of these problems that that we're talking about right now well mm -hmm. so going back to polybase um are there any other kinds of plans that you want to share with us about you know what you have going forward, things that people should be looking out for, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, we're pretty pretty public um, about our roadmap and what we're building. Um, but at a very high level, in the next couple of months, I'm pretty excited about a couple of things. The first is our private mainnet. So this is our production level service. 
um, first customers have started to onboard and, and, and build production applications. So that's really cool. This is our first transition from our test net to our main net. Um, the second thing I'm really excited about is very soon we'll be shipping our production uh, ZK infrastructure. And so that's going to allow you to write that code in Polylang. Uh, we're building our own compiler that compiles that down to ZK proofs. Uh, so then you can actually run functions over code and prove that you ran those functions correctly. Uh, this will be the first time that, that ZK technology is so easily accessible to developers. Um, Congratulations. If you want to use it, if you want to use ZK today, it's actually really, really hard. Um, you have to write like some assembly code and do a bunch of like comp compilation stuff and really complicated stuff. Um, we're making it as easy as like writing JavaScript in your browser, basically. That's um, amazing. So that's, that's really, really exciting for us. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just really excited to kind of talk to more folks in the industry and, and see what everyone else is building. I think what we're building is like foundational enough that pretty much anyone building in Web3 uh, can have some benefit from building on Polybase. So I talked about DEXs, being able to offload data on chain to off chain, decentralized social, DeFi, other DeFi applications. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I love to talk. So, I, you know, we have a call link for a 10 minute chat with me that's public. Hit me up, we can chat. Oh, cool. That's awesome. That's really cool. On that note, um, if you have sort of one message, or it can be more than one, but if you have a main message for regulators, what would it be? I think it's going to sound generic, but just clarity, right? I think <laughs> like we can look at some of it. I'm talking about the U.S. specifically since I'm based here in the U.S., but sure. we can look at some of the uh, progress that European nations have made, um, take a look at some of the rules that they're creating. Um, but yeah, we just need some rules. I don't mind uh, the regulation being put in place. I'm not, you know, an anarchist or I'm not this, this person that says like, we need to do things outside of government um, purview. Uh, but I think we need clarity. And the reason I say that, I think a lot of people will say, no, like, no, like Web3 was supposed to be outside government control. But, you mm -hmm. know, like you mentioned earlier and very early in the podcast, you said, you know, people are launching these projects and basically rug pulling and swindling people. And it's happening multiple times now. And it's the whole point is, is government is supposed to come in and protect, um, you know, against these bad actors harming the public. Right. That is a, that is actually a fundamental role of government. And I think the proof is there that we do need some regulation because too many people have done too big of bad things at this point. We kind of ruined mm -hmm. it for ourselves again. Um, and so, yes, I, I do think we need um, regulation. I think treating uh, tokens as securities uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I think there's probably a couple uh, exceptions and rules that need to be created around the different types of tokens. Um, but I think overall it makes sense because then it allows all of the existing you know, institutional infrastructure that we've built up around securities, which is decades and decades and decades old, all of the existing legal corpus and precedents that we've created around this applies. It's just much more useful to bring it into an existing system uh, than try to rebuild that system um, from scratch. And I know a lot of like really hardcore DGENs will- I'm shocked, yes. That. I know. I know. <laughs> It sounds shocking, but I think when you look at like the practical uses, you are going to have court mm -hmm. cases and lawsuits that come up in a Web3 context. And if you have no precedence for them, uh, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to get to the right answer uh, and an answer that, you know, generally the public or, you know, the existing um, institutional institutions believe in. Um, I think the freedom and the uh, benefits that we get from Web3, a lot of them can still apply in this kind of scenario. Um, but being outside of regula regulatory control is extremely dangerous. It also mm -hmm. limits the amount of utility um, that the industry can have. I mean, you look at all these enterprises, you look at TradFi, they're all waiting. They want to be involved in Web3. 
they've been there's trying an enormous and amount of pressure pent up sort of pressure not enormous they yeah. want to, you know they're like you know these guys are dealing with like trillions of dollars right like jp morgan is like 100 trillion dollars of like volume going around they want to be able to access this permissionless kind of system and liquidity uh but they can't because it just exposes them to too much regulatory risk right so I think if we get that clarity and we bring that into the system, we'll actually get a lot of benefits to people that want to operate in the system. Um, I think the big question that always comes up is KYC. Um, and folks just don't want to be KYC in this kind of system. Um, I'm not going to say whether, like, I, I don't have an opinion on whether that's, you know, required or not required or should be or whatever. Um, all I know is that KYC reduces risk of transacting with other parties. There's ways to do anonymous KYC, which sounds like an oxymoron, but actually mm -hmm. you can use ZK technology to accomplish things like that. To accomplish, actually one of our customers is actually building something like this in a uh, bond market context where when you wanna buy an asset from someone, who they are, actually can influence the price of that asset, which can be problematic for the seller. Yeah, um, sure. sure. Now you see that with just like, just to bring that down to regular people, like you see that like with airline tickets, like depending on what region you are looking at a ticket in, it will change the price of the ticket. Right mm -hmm. now, but, but what you want to be able to do is trust that the person you're buying from is a trustworthy party right? Mm -hmm. That they have a certain amount of assets that they've transacted on this platform before. How can you do that without knowing who they are? Well, you can actually use zero knowledge proofs to have a third party kind of like verify that in a cryptographically trusted way so that I don't need to know who that person is, but I can, you know, verify that they've transacted on this platform more than a hundred times. They've done more than X amount of value in the system. Um, so that I can transact with them without them giving up their identity that they're like a big conglomerate or they're from a particular nation or whatever. So KYC is important, but it doesn't have to mean that you are like you're letting go of all your privacy. Again, like I mentioned before, the internet and blockchain and Web3 has created these new paradigms. We can't fight against it. All we can do is create new technology to allow us to make them safe and fair and usable. Um, and that's that's what we're trying to do. And that's that's what I really believe in. That was it's really interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that some more. Um, OK, great. Well, final question. What kind of Internet do you want? I think I already answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I, I want an Internet that um, is fair, that uh, doesn't have spam, um, and that makes people uh, stake something um, if they want to be heard. Um, that something may not always be monetary, actually, because then you're kind of discriminating against people with, with low monetary as uh, value. Um, it can be other things. But I think that, that staking of reputation, that staking of who you are monetary is so important um, because it helps us battle that, that the craziness that the internet is today. Um, so yeah, that, that's really the kind of internet I want to see. Um, and I think we're, we have all, we actually have all the building blocks today to yeah. build that internet. We actually do. We have all the technology today to build that internet. That's the crazy thing. Um, I think we just need to go do it. We need to be all aligned that this is a vision that we want. Um, and we actually just need a couple really brilliant people to come and push that agenda forward uh, and be leaders in, in, in making that happen. Awesome. Great answer. Thank you so much. Builders, go talk to Sid. He has some really interesting technology. And um, thank you very much for the discussion. I enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time, everyone. Likewise. Thanks. Thank you.